<laughs> well, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Doreen Peterson. I'm president and founder of the American College of Healthcare Sciences. And uh, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share one of my most favorite and passionate subjects, uh, eating, thinking, and eliminating. And, th <laughs> and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. An everyday journey to wellness and happiness. So we can all do it. We can all eat, we hope, and we can all pray, which I am also calling thinking, and we can all love, which I'm also calling elimination. And you'll see why by the time we get to the end of the, of the talk. But we can't all travel to achieve it. And who's read Eat, Pray, Love? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. We can't all go to Italy to learn how to eat. Mind you, we probably don't need to. We can't all go to India to learn how to think and pray. And we can't all go to Bali to fall in love. And some of us just may prefer to drink, play, and, well, you can read. <laughs> so today's goal, we're going to learn what is eating for wellness. We're going to learn why does what we think affect our health. Imagine what we think affecting how we feel. How can we improve our elimination? and some really daily, simple daily tips for the wellness journey. So focusing on what we eat, what we think, aka pray, and eliminate, aka love, also known as. So let's talk about what is the basis of holistic health. One of the underlying belief systems in holistic health is that your body has the ability to heal itself. And it's really important that you believe that. And you're all going to get copies of this, so um, if you want to take notes, great, because I may say some things that are not in the, in the uh, overheads, but um, don't feel like you have to write everything down. So we, we're going to learn to work with our body, not against it. And we're really going to believe that in, we have this innate ability to heal. We're also going to learn how to practice wellness every day. It's not something that just happens at the end or at the beginning or halfway. We're going to learn about using safe and non-toxic holistic treatment and protocols. And we're going to remember what we eat and think and do not eliminate today, we become tomorrow. So what is a healthy lifestyle? We really need to learn to live each day as if our health depends on it, because it does. I mean, that is the primary, in my opinion, gift that we can all give ourselves. It doesn't matter how rich we are. It doesn't matter what a gorgeous car we drive. It doesn't matter how many bathrooms in your house. If you're not healthy and well, none of that matters. So for me, it's the basis of everything. So we're going to learn to eat healthy. We're going to drink plenty of water. We're going to exercise regularly. We're going to minimize toxins and we're going to reduce stress. It's pretty simple. Of course, doing it is the thing. So what really helps me and what I think has helped a lot of people is think of food as fuel for your body. You're eating because you've got to put fuel in your body. You put gas in your car, you're putting food in your body. Without it, your body is not going to produce energy. You're not going to be able to do what you need on a daily basis. And ideally, 60% of our daily food fruit and veggies should be raw. It preserves both the nutrients and the life force. And we're going to talk more about that. And how much is 60%? I like to think of it on my plate. So whenever I build my plate, whenever I'm serving my meals, I want to say at least half of my plate is preferably cooked, preferably raw, and maybe some cooked. And of course, as winter comes on, we might want to cook even more, but we're going to learn ways to cook as well. A quarter of it's going to be lean protein. Now that can be tofu, it can, it can be uh, quinoa, if you're a vegan, it can be fish, it can be poultry, it can be meat. Now ideally, all of this is also going to be organic, and we can talk more about why that's important. And then also, is you want about a quarter whole grains and there's some suggestions there. So it's pretty simple 
um, to think about it as your plate. And if you're thinking 60% of your food needs to be raw every day, just chop your plate in half, make sure, it doesn't matter what size of plate you're using, make sure that is your raw food. Now why does raw food preserve nutrients? Well, clearly a raw seed can germinate and grow, a boiled or cooked seed is pretty dead. Vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients and more importantly enzymes are preserved when you eat raw and enzymes are like the catalysts in your body that spark many uh, uh, health uh, things in the body that you need in order to, for example, absorb nutrients, assimilate uh, a variety of minerals and vitamins. So enzymes are really, really important. And in my opinion, that's one of the most important reasons that we need to eat raw food. One of the other things is raw food and fiber. Now fiber is my passion at the moment. Uh, I'm a great believer in fiber. Uh, fiber uh, is a really a large requirement. We need about 35 grams a day and most of us do not get that. And uh, it's really difficult to, um, to get that fiber. So you, you, half your plate is raw food you're going to be sure you're going to be getting more fiber in your diet. And of course that has the added benefit of ensuring that you're going to be eliminating. And we're going to talk more about fiber later. Do you get enough daily fiber? When you, yeah, right, when you have the time to multitask in the bathroom, you're pretty sure you're not. Uh, constipation. Now constipation is interesting in that Sometimes people do not appreciate that they are constipated. Now I, uh, I trained as a naturopath in New Zealand and I did naturopathic uh, work there in a clinic for many years. And one thing sticks in my mind because of course you know when you are uh, discussing uh, elimination and health with a patient you're going to be talking about bowel movements. I asked a patient, do you have regular bowel movements? Yes, I do. I have no problem at all with my bowel movements. I said, well, that's terrific. He said, I go every Wednesday. <laughs> he did not think that was constipation. I mean, so, <laughs> constipation is if you go less than minimal once a day and not only go to the bathroom, you want to have a decent size stall and that is really important. And it's really important to look at your stools. And we're going to be talking more about also observing your urine later on as well. This is the love part. <laughs> you really love yourself when you look at your stools, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> hemorrhoids. If you have any hemorrhoids at all from straining, from constipation, you know you're not getting enough fiber. High blood sugar. Fiber is important for that. High cholesterol, most people don't even think of that. But if you have high cholesterol, you're not getting enough fiber in your diet. Now fiber is interesting. When I started looking at fiber, I actually didn't appreciate there's two different kinds of fiber. There's insoluble fiber and soluble. And we really want to have both in our diet. So I thought we'd take a closer look at what insol insoluble fiber is. It moves bulk through the intestines. It actually controls the pH and acidity in the intestine, which again is important for assimilation because in the small intestine is where you're going to be doing most of your absorption. And if the pH in there gets off, you don't absorb your nutrients. And it doesn't matter how much raw food you eat, it doesn't matter how organic, how wonderful your food is, if you're not assimilating and metabolizing your food correctly, you are not going to experience, you know, real health and energy and feel great. Benefits, well we talked about that, controls regular bowel movement, promotes regular bowel movements, prevents constipation. It actually moves toxic waste through your bowel in more time and that is really important too. You don't want waste material to be sitting in your bowel because, anyone can think why? Right. 
They say death begins in the colon. That's a really good comment, Barbara. Well, the reason we don't want material sitting in the bowel is that every little drop of blood that's in your body eventually passes through the bowel as well. So all of that material is going to be absorbed back into your blood if it's not, and it puts a lot of strain on your liver, if it's not eliminated. So hence, it's one of my favorite subjects. We also talked about the pH, and the pH is not just important for enzymes, but it's also important for preventing microbes and other you know, cells and toxins that can potentially set up cancerous um, uh, cell structures in the body. So food sources, we're all veggies, we talked about that. Fruit skins and root vegetable skins, don't peel, we're gonna learn about not peeling. Whole wheat products and wheat bran, corn bran and seeds and nuts. Soluble fiber. Now you might wonder, why is it called soluble, insoluble? Well, clearly it means it doesn't dissolve in water, right? So soluble fiber will actually turn into kind of like a, a mush, like a gel, exactly. What this is good for, uh, binding with fatty acids, it actually slows emptying in your tummy, so it makes you feel full longer and particularly good for um, hypoglycemia or situations with unbalanced blood sugar because it regulates blood sugar and allows sugar to be released more slowly. But more importantly is the cholesterol issue. So many people these days have issue with cholesterol and it actually lowers the LDL cholesterol, which as we know is the bad stuff. And we know what LDL cholesterol <coughs> does. If you have too much of it, it keeps recirculating in your blood and eventually the body's going, what the heck? I've got to put this stuff somewhere. So it lines your arterial walls because, you know, it's just trying to get rid of it and there's no other way for it to get it out of the body. And, of course, eventually, as you know, with reduced uh, diameter in your artery, you're going to get increased blood pressure, just like when you squeeze a hose and the water shoots out harder. That's what happens with your arteries. Pretty simple. So regulates blood sugar, so really important for people with diabetes or even some, you know, even a precursor to that, as I said, hypoglycemic people can really benefit from taking more soluble fiber. Good sources, barley, dried beans and peas, nuts, fruits, oranges, apples, veggies such as carrots, some food sources contain both. Flax seeds, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite all time uh, things to add to my diet every day. Organic, whole flax seeds and grind them every day. Get a little coffee grinder, that's all you do in it. I grind mine, I use a couple of teaspoons on pretty much everything, my salads and my smoothies, on my yogurt. Um, whatever's left over, I just put the whole coffee grinder in the fridge, I don't even have time to decant it into a jar or anything, and then I have a little bit left over the next day, and I just do enough for a couple of days. An absolutely fabulous form of <coughs> fibre, plus the added benefit of being a great source of essential fatty acids. It's really a, a great way to take, um, kill two birds with one stone. But you know, don't worry, just eat fibre. I mean, don't worry, is it soluble or insoluble? Am I getting enough soluble? Am I getting enough insoluble? Don't worry about that. Love your body enough to go, okay, have I had a decent bowel movement today? Nope, I need more fiber. That's all you really need to be thinking about. And obviously, if you have high cholesterol, hypoglycemia or anything like that, you may want to think a little more closely. But basically, you're just gonna regulate it by focusing on your elimination. But remember that you need 35 grams, and it's like, well, geez, how much is that? I mean, if somebody told me I needed 35 grams of fiber, I'd be like, well, okay, I don't really know how much that is. So the good thing is to start reading labels. Now, this makes shopping very slow, but you want to get into the habit of looking at labels before you buy anything. And here you see dietary, of course, it's really important to look at the serving size first. 
you want to look at how much dietary fiber. Zero grams, six grams. So this is the one we're going to buy. Obviously you want to look at other things as well. Your, your fat and um, you know, your calories, calories from fat. This, this is just a much better deal. Now what I like to do when I shop, I, I shop reading labels. As I said, it slows you down. But once you have your list and you know what products are good, they're clean, they've got high fiber, you know what bread has high fiber, there's a really good um, uh, Dave's Bread. Does anyone eat Dave's Bread? Now, if you look at Dave's Bread's labels, some of them are higher, higher fiber than others. So go with the one that's um, four grams in one slice. That's pretty good. Now, there's also a bread in Trader Joe's that's um, eight grams per slice. So it'll mean you have to read through all the labels on the bread and Trader Joe's because right now I can't remember the brand name but it's a great bread. Unfortunately some of the other health food stores don't have it. But in one slice of bread you can get eight grams of fiber so that's pretty good. 50% of your plate should be raw, remember that, raw organic veggies and pretty much you're going to be covered. But can you always eat raw? Well, let's face it, no. You don't want to eat raw beans, legumes, peanuts. Peanuts, they say, actually contain an enzyme inhibitor that interferes with protein digestion. Well, I don't know. I don't often eat cooked peanuts, to be honest. Um, I mean, I know every now and again you see them in Thai food or something like that. Roasted. Yeah. Roasted. Well, yeah, they do roast them. Yeah, but, you know, my... My idea for this was really just don't eat raw peanuts when you're eating protein. I mean that's, you know, food combining is a whole other subject but it is a really important one. Now they say not to eat red, uh, raw red cabbage, Brussels sprouts, I can't imagine anyone would want to eat raw Brussels sprouts, <coughs> blueberries, which, really? yes, isn't that interesting, blackberries, is there any other way to eat blueberries and blackberries? They contain an enzyme that destroys thiamine, vitamin B1. And heating also inactivates this, uh, this uh, enzyme. My suggestion here would be, okay, well forget about the Brussels sprouts. You can cook those. Uh, I personally say to eat raw red cabbage and blueberries and blackberries. Just make sure you get more B1. Well, you're going to get that, sunflower seeds, beans, lentils. So you can balance things. So if somebody tells you, well, actually, you know, you can't eat these things because of this or that, you know, you know that once you find out what it is in activating, you can ensure that you're just getting more of that. Now, they also say tomatoes. Yes, Michael. Um, I had a question about broccoli and some of the related vegetables. Family that they have to quite a bit of it. That's saying you shouldn't eat that raw because of the mold that's inherent in the process of organic. In broccoli? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I mean, there are, uh, the question was don't eat broccoli and plants in that family because of potential mold, uh, whether the vegetable is organic or not organic. That's a very good possibility, Michael, and I would think that uh, if you have issues with, for example, candida or, uh, or thrush, maybe that is something you would want to, um, you know, very gently steam or, um, or maybe even stir fry slightly, and uh, so that's a very good point. It's not something I've really come across, though, mold in my broccoli. Though, I have to confess, sometimes my broccoli can stay two weeks in my, what do they call it, crisper? <laughs> sometimes I call my crisper my rotter <laughs> because I open my drawer and I'm like, didn't crisp well enough. <laughs> so, but I always like to think that my veggies can go off if I don't cook them or, or eat them, I should say, soon enough because what is that saying to me? They're not covered in, in uh, preservatives and things that would 
I often, I really don't eat, it, for example, salad bars and things like that because a lot of those vegetables are coated in preservatives to stop them wilting and going off. Tomatoes and lycopene. Now lycopene is a fantastic antioxidant and that again is a whole other subject, antioxidants. Really, really important, essential to reduce this um, barrage of free radicals that's cursing through your body wanting to latch on to other molecules and do all sorts of damage and cause inflammation. So antioxidants are great, so anything red or yellow, uh, those are all really important veggies. Watermelon, carrots. Now they say that tomatoes are best cooked to preserve the lycopene. Again, you know, I like my tomatoes <coughs> raw, I'll cook some. I think balance is important. So it's always important when you see contraindications to look behind the scene and really think about what is being told. But there are other places, other times you wouldn't want to eat raw. So raw dairy. Now raw dairy has become a topical conversation. A lot of people prefer non-pasteurized dairy. And when I was preparing for this lecture, I was really looking at that topic trying to understand what is behind this trend for unpasteurized dairy. I mean, there's a reason they started pasteurizing, right? Anyone know why? Right, infection. E. coli, staphylococcus, you name it, milk can contain it. And all those little microbes don't sit well in our stomach and we end up getting sick. So, I mean, they didn't just start it because they wanted to build a bunch of equipment to scold milk. So when I look behind it, I actually could not find any research to show that unpasteurized milk was really, or unpasteurized cheeses, were really any more healthy. The only thing I was able to find was that if uh, children suffer from a lot of allergies, that they can respond better to unpasteurized uh, milk and cheese. Possibly. But you see, there again, I'd want my kids to get enzymes through raw vegetables rather than raw milk. I wouldn't want to take the risk. So personally, my opinion, I would not go with raw milk. I just, uh, so having said that, I grew up, my dad milked a cow. Her name was Blossom. Beautiful, beautiful cow. He milked her twice a day and the biggest treat in the world was when dad would bring home the milk can and we'd get to stick our finger in there and of course it was just solid cream, most of it. And of course, you know, that's what we'd get. But my mum did scold the milk before she let us use it. And they made butter and everything so it was pretty great. The most important thing I believe in dairy is organic. Because, you know, if it's not organic, they put uh, bovine growth hormone into these products, unfortunately. And that means that the cow is going to be producing more milk. And um, that is not a nice substance to be taking into our body. So some food you should never eat raw. Um, meat, poultry, eggs. I know a lot of people will put an egg in a smoothie. I do not personally think that's a good idea. Again, E. coli, staph, you name it. I mean, that whole egg recall we just went through. Now, even organic eggs, organic eggs are not necessarily cage-free. I only just found that out. That bothered me. Of course, I eat organic eggs. I hate to think of taking in estrogen in my egg, you know, I figure I get enough estrogen everywhere else. So I always buy organic and of course you pay more, but I, yeah, I just discovered they're not necessarily cage free. So now it's really important to read the label and go organic and cage free. So think about that next time you buy. And of course raw potatoes, uh, just doesn't sound good. We talked about life force. Now this may or, be, may or may not be something you believe in because it does require you to step away from scientific fact. And of course, 
I come from a science background. Uh, I trained in sciences. I trained as a naturopath here at the American College of Healthcare Science. We focus on, on science, uh, the, the research that shows that uh, traditional and complementary alternative medicine is, is uh, viable and, and correct. But life force is something that has defied science. However, they were able to show that water does retain molecular memory. Now there was a piece of research that actually proved that homeopathy is very viable because they were able to find the molecular structure of the original constituent within the homeopathic remedy. And you may or may, know, uh, may or may not know with a homeopathic remedy, there's actually no physical substance of the initial ingredient left because it's been diluted so many times and energized. So of course homeopathy is made with all sorts of strange things. Some of them poison, belladonna for example. So you wouldn't want any of the original remedy left in the, uh, in the uh, homeopathic remedy. The curly in photography has been incredible because it's been able to show us that everything basically has a life force. There, there's uh, energy vibrating from each and every one of us, we just can't see it. There's energy vibrating from each and every object in this room, we just can't see it. In fact, even if an object is solid, appears solid, feels solid, it is really just a collection of vibrating molecules, vibrating at such a rate that it, that it is solid. But still, there is an emanation from that. So raw food is going to keep this life force intact. And uh, we like to think, and this is where the prey comes in, we visualize that our food that is energized with life force is giving us that extra healing and wellness that's going to really keep us jazzed in life. Scientific studies in raw food, so here comes the science. And uh, when you get the PowerPoint, you'll see the one, two, and three on these bullet points actually gives you the studies. So there has been studies to show that raw food does indeed reduce cholesterol, the bad stuff, LDL. It does indeed help symptoms of fibromyalgia. Now, you may or may not think of something as fibromyalgia, but you know, problems concentrating, headaches, migraines, uh, pain in your jaws, stiffness when waking up. How many of us don't feel that? Now, it could be just a bad mattress too, but chronic muscle and joint pain, sensitivities to chemicals, menstrual cramping, diarrhea or constipation. There's all sorts of things here on this uh, diagram that, sh that uh, are termed fibromyalgia. And many of those individual symptoms can be supported and alleviated just by adding raw food to your diet. I mean, how simple can that be? Rheumatic disorders as well, they've been able to show that raw food has an incredible impact on that. So real life application, let's talk about what we can do. Hands up who eats raw food now? Okay, pretty much everyone. 50%? Okay, Steve, great. Okay, so the we'll, we'll, rest of us, we're all gonna get there. So the first thing is plan your plate. You've got your plate, you're gonna chop it in half, you're gonna put half of it raw. Now, you might find everyone in your family doesn't wanna do it. You should see me and my husband, we sit down, here's my plate, Salad spilling out over one side, a little bit of something like maybe brown rice, and then you know, maybe some tofu or whatever. My husband, a big hunk of steak, nothing green, nothing. I said, Do you want some salad, honey? Oh, no, maybe I'll have some later. Does he ever? No, he might have salad once a week. Am I gonna? you know, harass him to eat, like I know he should, no, I mean, he's an adult. You know, but I mean, so not everyone in your family might do it, but the thing is, we all have to take responsibility for our, our own health. And, you know, I see health as not only an everyday affair, 
but it's a lifelong commitment. Because I sure as heck don't want to be down the end of the road as an 80 year old woman, you know, unable to get up in the morning, feel great, walk around the block, and you know, really be energized with my life. So old age does not have to equal degeneration. And all of these illnesses we think of as, oh, well, I'm getting old. We're going to stop thinking that. Don't have to happen. Do great. And you might be surprised what you can grate. Now, I don't know. I love grated food, but these graters, you know, I chip my knuckles. I do things with my fingernails. I mean, you've really got to be committed to use your grater. But of course, there are other things now, you know, those food processes. You just put a carrot in and it goes and grates it for you. Love them. So if you can, get a little one. I invested in one and I found that now I, you know, I'll grate. Because, you know, when you're busy, you don't want to go home and spend half an hour grating food. Do you? But you want to buy it whole. You don't want to buy it grated. Anyone think why? Preservatives. preservatives. Yep, it could have preservatives in it. But even if it's organic, the minute you chop or cut, it oxidizes and you start to lose nutrients. Don't boil. Even if you're going to cook, never, never boil. If you do boil, just use a little bit of water and then take that water and either drink it or save it in your fridge and use it for like a, a smoothie when it's cold or put it as a basis for your soup or a stew or something like that. If you are going to steam veggies, cover and serve them quickly because oxygen, as Steve says, oxidization, boom, you can lose so many nutrients just like that. We talked about using the cooking water. If only use a little bit and use leftovers. Don't peel. Now this is another way, another uh, where my husband cooks. You buy organic. I've got him that trained. And he's great that way. But he will peel everything. I mean, he's a New Yorker, you know. Sorry, Connie. I mean, he grew up with a mom who made white this, mashed this, white sugar this. And of course, the only pizza in the world has to come from New York. Very strong food, uh, very strong opinions about food was really where I was going with that. Peeling. I don't peel potatoes. Now, I don't eat non-organic potatoes. And we're going to talk a little bit down uh, in another slide about organic and what to eat and what not to eat. But you don't have to, you don't have to peel a potato. Obviously, you want to wash a bit of mud off. I never peel carrots, ever. I grate red beets with that funky looking skin on. I never peel the skin off. So just do not peel. The minute you peel, you're just saying bye bye to all the vitamin C. And the potassium. And that's just so important, potassium. Don't chop. This is great for a cook like me because, you know, I, me cooking is making a salad. That's what I think of as cooking, you know. And uh, if my husband didn't cook, oh, look, it's telling me I've got to do something. Excuse me one moment. A newer version of growl. We'll just stop that. Don't chop. Destroys vitamins. Again, we talked about oxidization. Plan your menus. Does anyone plan their menus? That's great, Brooke. That's great. You know what? I don't do this, I must confess, but I'm going to start because, I mean, I guess I do do it in that I will always have raw vegetables in my, uh, I was going to say rotter, but I'm going to be kind and call it my crisper. I'll always you know, go out in the weekend either to the farmer's market and, you know, get a, a big load of, of fresh veg and, um, and all organic. But also I've started thinking more about my grains. So, for example, in the morning I might, I might soak my uh, uh, chickpeas. So when I get home in the evening, they're already soaked. I just rinse them off and it doesn't take me very long to cook them up and things like that. So I am getting more um, organized as far as menu planning. 
So when I looked at this, I guess menu planning Monday, I guess that's what we're all meant to do because everywhere I looked, everyone plans menus on Monday. So, well, we'll be we missed this week. We'll start next Monday, right? We'll all plan a weekly menu. Include snacks, because snacks are important. Don't shop when you're hungry. We, we all know that. I mean, that's just deadly. Buy organic where possible. Now, this is a really important uh, earl here, this www.ewg.org. And what's, what's really good about this is there is an app you can download. Anyone got a smartphone? Anyone got an iPhone? Okay, anyone got a phone that you can use apps on? Okay, good. So, Kimmy, go to your whatever and download the app for the Dirty Dozen. And that's going to give you a list of foods you should absolutely never, ever, ever buy if they're not organic. They're heavily pesticide and herbicide and you just don't want to eat them. It's also going to give you a list of, of um, foods that you would think, should I, shouldn't I? You know, does it matter? Uh, and of course, you know, these are things we have to think about. Organic food does cost more and it's a reality, you know. I mean, we have to think about the bottom line. But the thing is, if I really want to buy celery and there's only non-organic celery in the store, I'm going to go without celery because non-organic celery is one of the worst vegetables you can eat. If I want an avocado and there's only non-organic avocado, I'm going to buy the avocado because it's okay. I probably would prefer an organic because in my opinion, organic food does have more nutrients and more life force. And I think they have, there is research to show that organic food definitely has more nutrients. But you know, at a pinch, I'll buy a non-organic. But I use my app. I go around the store with my list. And I, if you don't have a smartphone on this website, you can download the list and you can print it off. And I carry, before I found the app, I carried that to the store. Because it's, it's a long list. So it's a good way to shop economically. Avoid pollution. This is actually a shot of Beijing. But I was in Indonesia recently. Yes, Michael. Uh, I like that second one. Uh, how do you know which organic food is organic and which is not? Like, I have a Really call yourself but organic, certif right? Certification organizations that you know of that can be used as a good guideline. Yeah. Very good question, Michael. Yes, I mean, organic is a term that actually it's not permitted to use it in this country when it doesn't, 100% organic, when it doesn't adhere to the USDA organic standards. So that's a really good point. Now, there are some organisations that are not, as Michael said, following that USDA organic standard, but they're still using the terminology. So this is an issue. Always look for the USDA or the Oregon Tilth, certified by Oregon Tilth. Oregon Tilth is a very good uh, certifying body. Um, or the USDA Green Label. Now, be careful because the other thing I've noticed, some stores are using a Green Label that looks just like the USDA. Have you seen that? It looks just like the USDA organic label. And do you know what it says? Locally grown. <laughs> now that does not mean organic. So you've got to be careful. And it's exactly the same colour, exactly the same look. I actually saw it for the first time this weekend and I was a little bit annoyed to be frank. I went and asked to speak to the shop manager because I'm like, well, do you have any organic food? And he takes me way around the back and there's a tiny little section of organic food. But it was really deceptive because at first I went to grab some of the salad thinking it was organic, but then I realised it wasn't because the label said locally grown. So be careful, that's a very good point. European standards are much more stringent than 
American standards, believe it or not. Asia, no standards, no standards at all. Very, very difficult there to get organic food. Um, we're very lucky here in Portland. Uh, I think there's more organic availability here than just about anywhere in the country that I've come across. One of the reasons I love living here is I can walk into a store and find things to buy. Even in other parts of the United States, you don't, you don't get that. So um, that is a very good point. Polluted air. I was recently in Indonesia on a, an essential oil um, study tour and uh, Jakarta was just like this. I actually didn't see blue sky or the sky full stop for at least a week. I was beginning to think it wasn't there. I mean it was really disturbing and I have been to places in China where we stepped up off the bus and you actually could not see the end of the bus. The air was black and everyone walks around wearing a mask because you're breathing in particulates. Not as bad here of course, thank goodness. I came back here, oh Portland just seemed the most wonderful town in the world. There was no traffic, I could see the sky. But you know, you fly over LA, you've all seen it, right? So pollution is really not good. Water, water is important. We must drink at least 32 ounces a day and we want to ensure that we're not drinking water that has chlorine and fluoride. We get enough of those chemicals in other places. We don't want to have those chemicals. We also don't want all the other things that can potentially be in water. A lot of stuff leaches into water. Um, so really important to use a water filtration system. Now if you don't have something to filter your water, I mean you can pick up one of those Brita filters that are pretty good. You can put something under the sink. That's what I have, it's just easier, but you've still got to change the filter every six months. Obviously a filter only works when you have a good filter in there. And, um, or you can get something actually on the sink as well. There's a variety of things you can get. If you don't have any of those things, maybe you can't afford any of those things, they say that putting a few blades of wheatgrass or actually any green plant in water will help to neutralize it. You've got to leave it in there overnight. So just minimize your exposure as much as possible. You know, obviously it's one world, right? I mean, if there's pollution and radiation in Japan, it's not going to be too long before it's here and unfortunately we got to see that earlier on in the year. So here we come to the think part of it, the prey. The power of positive thought. So we really are able to show with studies, and this I think is just really exciting, that thinking positively and visualizing yourself healthy actually affects the physical way your brain looks. The hippocampus part of the, pra of the, of the brain um, changes color and enlarges. Um, it, it's really a great study and again I've put the, um, the reference there in the notes section of the PowerPoint so you can check that out. And even more exciting I thought is NCAM which is the federal government funded centre that's studying complementary alternative medicine actually funds studies like this. They're looking at prayer, they're looking at the power of positive thought, they're looking at these really like way out things, think about it, the government is actually paying people to do this research. I think this is phenomenal. I love the United States. I mean, I think this is incredible. And they're getting great results. It's simple. We don't have to go to India and sit cross-legged and talk to gurus, unless you want to, of course, and that's fun. But really, all you have to do is focus on your breathing. You can do that walking. You don't have to sit. You can do that sitting. You can do that waiting for the bus. You can do that watching TV. You can do that when you first wake up in the morning. Now sometimes it's hard to get started. So it's really interesting what the power of a word can do. Just one word, maybe two words. Find two words that gel for you. And as you breathe in, say one word. As you breathe out, say the other word. 
and just see how long you can keep that going. Now for me, my words are so hum. As I breathe in, I say, say, so. In my mind, as I breathe out, I say hum. And I just put my mind to the place just here and I feel the breath going up through my nostrils and coming out. And that's, and the so hum just fills my mind. I really don't think of anything else. And it kind of gives you a mind break, a holiday. So that's a little bit of mindfulness there. But visualization is really important too. No matter what you want in your life, if you see it in your mind, really clear your mind, do, your, do a little bit of meditation and then see it, it can have an incredible impact on your life. See yourself well, see yourselves, get right down in your body, think about your bell, look, look inside your body with your mind and think about your liver and massage it and tell your liver you love it and send it love. And really see it as really doing a great job. It's pumping out enzymes, it's filtering your blood, it's lowering the LDL, it's just taking care of you. And you know, it's terrific. Of course, stress, we all have it. Anxiety, <coughs> most of us have that. Depression, chronic, chronic pain, these are all things that just positive thinking can help to overcome. I love this little <laughs> symptoms of the hurried woman's stress syndrome. Moody, scattered rushed anxiety, weight, gra weight gain, no interest in sex, so on and so forth. I mean, who wants to live like that? None of us. More importantly, we can start getting elevated blood pressure. Our heart rate is constantly elevated. We get this bronchiodilation and increased ventilation, so your lungs are working over time. The blood glu glucose increases, which puts a tremendous uh, burden on your pancreas and your liver. The whole central nervous system is in a constant state of fight or flight. It's that thing of somebody cuts you off and you get that little like oh, feeling, you know, that's cortisol pumping out into your system. Taking an enormous amount of energy and, and setting up all sorts of inflammatory responses that you don't have to have. Don't go there. Use your two words, breathe. Decreased inflammatory uh, and immune responses that is a scary thing because that is really the start of all those things we talked about, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on and so forth. So wellness is happening every day. Simple things we can do. Okay, we've talked about positive thinking. That's our prey. Plants. Plants are great. Put plants everywhere. Pot them up, put them in your home, put them in your office. Soaking in the bath. Now some of you might not have a bath. Hands up who has a bath. Okay, great. Hands up who takes baths. Okay, good, good. Because you know, a lot of people don't. They have a bath and they never use it. Because you know, we're busy, we don't have time. You use your bath. You have a bath, use it. At least once a day do a bath ritual. Light a candle, put some essential oils in there, play some music, get a good book. You know, really just chill out. And as you're in there, visualize wellness and success. And practice your mindful breathing. If you don't have a bath, you can do it with a foot bath, with a nice big bowl. You can sit with your feet in hot water. That's a good thing to do too. If you don't even want to do that, you can just put your hands in a bowl of hot water with some essential oils. That's a nice thing to do too. So there are other ways to get around it. Exercise, some good things to do. Yoga, hands up anyone who does yoga. Okay, great, terrific. There's just one simple salute to the sun. If, even if you can just learn that one thing, and there's a, a brief diagram of it here, salute to the sun is just a terrific thing to do, even if you only do it twice a day. 
So it's just great. Enjoy life. I know, you know it seems, seems obvious, doesn't it? Enjoy life. You know, sometimes it's really hard. You wake up in the morning, oh my God, you've got this to do, that to do. The kids have got to get to school. You haven't done this. You've got to pay this. Blah, 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 blah. Your mind is going 10 to the dozen, you know. And it's hard just to stop and enjoy. Smell the roses. And of course, you know, if you watch the news, whew, forget about it. Right there, you're going, yikes. Do something fun every day. Just it could be walk in the park, watch a comedy, enjoy your dinner just something. I like to do the next one particularly. I like before I go to sleep every night, I don't usually write it down, but if you're a journaler you might want to write it down, but I just think, I try and think five things that happened in my life that day that I feel really grateful for. And it can be really something simple, just like a nice smile from someone, or having smelled a beautiful rose, or being able to help somebody. You know, it can be different, obviously different for everyone, but just five things that you really are feeling good about. I'm a great believer in counting your blessings because boy, we can always look at the cup half empty, right? I mean, there's always gonna be problems. Let's face it, life is about problems. Life is every time you look around, it's everywhere. In our own individual lives, in our friends' lives, people are getting sick. We've all got families, we're in the middle of a recession, we're in the middle of wars. It's a terrible thing, but I think we have to count our blessings. And if we really practice that every day, it can really help. 30 minutes of walking every day. Now this is hard to get in if you're busy, right? But you can break it up. You can do 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at lunchtime, 10 minutes when you get home. Just around the block. If it's raining, in the mall, somewhere it's dry. So you can live wellness, but it's what we have to do every day. So, but you know what? It's easy to fall off the wagon, you know? You go out for a party, you drink too much, you eat too much, you wake up feeling like, Ugh, you know? So you don't exercise that day, and then all you want to eat is fried food. You go have a Big Mac, you have ham, you have uh, uh, French fries, or whatever, you drink a Coke, and then the next day you think, oh, what the heck, you know? Oh, I guess I have a little bit of whatever, raw food, but no, nah, I really feel like this, I really want a Coke and fries or whatever. And you might do that for four or five days, and sometimes it's hard to pull yourself back and go, you know what, I don't feel so great. Doesn't matter, don't go down that, oh my God, it's no point, I can't keep it up, I'm a loser. Those are all negative things to be playing in your mind. Don't should. You know, when I, you know, don't should. When I was pretty young, you know, of course when you're at school you have to read certain books, right, for English. So I'm struggling away through some of these novels thinking, oh, this book, it's just like, oh, I can't understand it. It's weird language, I don't want to read it. And so I'd say to my teacher, you know what, I don't like this book. I love reading, I loved reading. I would read voraciously, but not all the books I was given to read, right? And I was told, you should read it. Why? So I really enjoyed becoming an adult. I decided from that moment on, any time somebody says should to me, I'm not gonna do it. And don't should yourself. Get support from people that care about you. That's helpful. You can make an individual contract with yourself if that works for you. It's good to set realistic goals. You know, I'm not gonna go to the gym every, at six o'clock every morning. You know, if I say that to myself and I don't go, you know, I mean, it just is crazy. I mean, who can get up at six o'clock in the morning and head out on a Portland winter morning and go to the gym? Some people can, I personally can't. Set realistic goals for you and reward yourself. I mean, here she's shopping. Whatever is a reward for you. So now we get to the love part, and I've got to go faster because we're at 12 o'clock. So why I call this love is because you really want to start loving your body, and to really focus on elimination, you have to really start looking at yourself and looking at your uh, eliminative organs. So they are the bowel, the liver, the lungs, the skin, skin, the kidneys, and the lymphatic system. Elimination. 
We talked about constipation. I wanted to show you the, the bowel because look at that dang thing. <laughs> that is all mushed up inside of you. I mean, no wonder it gets stuck. Think about it. They say if you took a bowel out, you could stretch it around a tennis court, I want to say twice. Oh, that just makes me stomach sore. Small intestine, that in itself is, is a miracle. That is a long hollow tube that receives partially digested food and most of the absorption that you really want to be, this is where it's going to happen. And remember what I said about absorption and assimilation? You're only as healthy as you assimilate. So keeping that pH through plentiful fibre is really important. The large intestine, this is where it gets really nasty. Because what it does is it comes up here in this like big wiggly mess and here, up and under my liver, it suddenly does this turn over on itself. I mean, how it's meant to get through there, I don't know. And then over here, it does the same thing, just to make life difficult. It actually like twists over on itself. So these are really frequent areas for blockages. Now, I'm particularly interested in bowel movements. It's really weird, I know, but I'm such a great believer in cleaning out your bowel that every couple of years, I wish I could say I go every year, but I can't, time-wise and money-wise, I go every couple of years, to a retreat where I eat nothing for 12 days. I have just uh, distilled water, uh, green juice, and pineapple juice. Don't look so perplexed, Barbara. It's all right. It's a controlled environment. <laughs> There's a really good article on fasting in this morning's Oregonian. Anyone see it? Yeah, it was really good. I was really thrilled to see it. I'm like, hey, that's what I'm talking about today. So. What's interesting, this program I do, okay, you're not eating anything, right? And you're meant to have prepared beforehand, so you give up coffee and you give up, you know, whatever else might be difficult for you. If, you know, people that go, some of them are smokers, you know, it just depends. Everyone can, everyone's at their own level. And uh, you just drop in and start. People are all in a different state of um, elimination and fasting when you arrive. But what is really interesting is you also do colonics, and I'm not advocating everyone go off and do a colonic, but you do colonics where you're actually cleaning the bowel out uh, at the same time, but, because of course when you stop eating after a few days, you don't have a bowel movement. Now would you believe after 12 days of not eating that there is still material coming away from the colonic? I mean, the thing is, no matter even if you don't suffer from constipation, your bowel still retains material in there that needs to come out. So, Barbara, I really liked your comment, death starts in the bowel. Really important to keep your bowel clean. So how do you do it without going off to Thailand every two years and going extreme like I do? Well, plenty of fibre, plenty of water, plenty of exercise, and if you can manage it every now and again, have a few days of fresh uh, veggie juices and maybe a nice potassium peel broth. And if you're interested, I can give you the recipe for that. We're going to love our bowel. This is the love part. Remember I told you why it's important not to keep uh, toxic material in your bowel because the blood that circulates through the bowel is also the blood that circulates through your brain. So you know yourself when you're constipated you feel kind of off, right? You're kind of sluggish, you can't really think straight, you might have a headache. So really a clean unobstructed bowel is going to give you a clear mind. Avoid constipation like the plague. I mean honestly if I'm constipated, oh, for me that's like I have to get unconstipated real quick. I do not like it. When I travel, it's really, you know, difficult. I don't know, I, I guess that's a confession of being old. And they say the more you age, right, is what you talk about, right? <laughs> I've talked about it forever. <laughs> so I must have been old to start with, but 
I was really fortunate when I went to naturopathic school, this was a huge focus, elimination. So I had some great teachers. Avoid constipation. Epsom salt bath, a very simple thing to do. Once a week, take an Epsom salt bath. Three cups to an average bath. Don't soak for too long, just 10 minutes. Longer than that, it's been said that you can start to reabsorb the toxins that, that uh, will be eliminated. So just uh, try that once a week, very simple. Your liver, look how big that is. Can you believe how big your liver is? It's actually the largest organ, largest solid organ in the body. Your skin is actually the largest organ, but it's the largest solid organ. And it does so much. It's so busy. It's like a factory. And one of the most important things in my mind about the liver is this pathway that pretty much everything travels down. All the toxins you take into your body, all the excess estrogen, all of the drugs, prescription, non-prescription, the alcohol, whatever it is you're putting in your body, it's got to travel down this pathway. And it's like I-5. It's called the P450 cytochrome pathway. It's like having I-5 in your liver. And if you take in a lot of toxins, if you've been drinking a lot of alcohol, if you take a lot of drugs, prescription, non-prescription, if the food you eat has a lot of pesticides, herbicides, it pretty much has a traffic jam. It, it only has so much capacity to filter and get rid of all this stuff and neutralize it. When there's a traffic jam in your P450 cytochrome pathway, guess what happens? The estrogen that you're taking in from, even if you try and avoid it, there's estrogen all around us. Plastics become estrogen in your body. When plastic leaches into food, it can be transformed into an estro estrogenic type substance in your body. The liver can't deal with it. The liver loves us, we love our liver. It's trying to do its best, so, but you know what? It's gonna go back out in your blood. It has to put that estrogen back out in your blood. It circles around, and guess where it now decides it's gonna go? It's gonna lock onto a receptor site in your breast. What happens when we get excess estrogen in our breast? Breast cancer. Really important to keep your liver healthy. Love your liver. Now who would think 15 drops of onion juice daily would benefit your liver? How simple is that? It doesn't taste great, but you know. A liver flush, now this is interesting. Anybody ever done a liver flush? Steve, have you done one? It's, it's a commitment. So I've given you some instructions there. If anyone's interested, I've also put my email at the end. Um, we can talk more about it, but um, it's a very, very interesting thing to do and uh, it can really be very good for your liver. More simple things, dandelion. Dandelion is just so wonderful. We've got a great dandelion coffee here. Uh, eat dandelion, you can um, pick it up. and Milk thistle, milk thistle. fabulous. Milk thistle's there too. And of course burdock. It's a wonderful root. You can actually eat burdock as a root vegetable. Uh, put it into your uh, soups and stews. Um, dandelion, uh, you can of course eat as a raw green. And the dandelion root, you can drink as a coffee. Fantastic. Your lungs. Can you think, imagine your lungs are in a limited of organ, but they are. And you know yourself, you know, when you've been eating something like, well, let's go onions again. You've got onion breath. You know, you do eliminate through your lungs. It's just something we don't think about. Obviously, carbon dioxide. But they also help to excrete products that are a result of overheated oils, which really cause a lot of problems with free radicals. Love your lungs. You want to deep breathe. And this is something you can practice when you're walking. And when you deep breathe, actually consciously think about really pushing out here, this part of your lung, really filling that up and bringing it all the way up here. And then when you breathe out, do the opposite. Push it out from here and then get it all out all the way down here. Even if you only do that 10 times a day, I like to do it when I first wake up. I wake up in the morning, I do some positive thinking, I do a few stretches, 
I'm still lying in bed. I haven't even got out yet. Self with, uh, which is really like a high enema, or you can go to a colonic uh, uh, specialist, and that is a more dramatic thing anyway. So when you go to a colonic specialist, you might want to do one colonic before, one col colonic during, and one colonic at the end. I think 10 to 20 is excessive. The kind we do in uh, the detox centre I go to in Thailand is really a high enema and um, I believe you can buy that equipment here in the United States too and it's, I mean, it's pretty simple to use. And those you would do every night uh, while you're in that fasting um, regime. So, good question. How many colonics is too many? 10 to 20? Yeah, well it depends over what time period too. But, um, so love your lungs. Good posture, really important. So we're all going to sit up straight. Now posture is difficult isn't it? Because you know we all kind of get tired and we tend to slump. But yeah, think about pulling your tummy in. And you know one thing that really helped me was um, one of my dance teachers said, you know, just imagine you have a silk thread from the very top of your head pulling your head up to pulling your head up to the ceiling and that really helps you visualize that because you know sometimes your head can get heavy on your shoulders right and then your shoulders get heavy and then everything else just slumps and it's all downhill from there so you know just we're not always going to have good posture um, if you really feel you need help with your posture of course you can put a book on your head and walk around you know that's helpful too sitting on a ball at your desk that can be really good one of those big balls that can really help Make sure you pull your tummy in, keep your back straight. And of course, really strong stomach muscles, so you, th that's something you really have to actively achieve, is gonna be good for your back. That's really what's protecting your back. And Steve knows all about back, so. The skin. Can you believe the skin is an eliminative organ? Well, we all sweat, right? So that's basically what is occurring. But what is interesting, it receives a third of all circulating blood and it should actually eliminate a third of all your waste. So sweating's important, perspiring's important. Don't use an antiperspirant. You can use a deodorant, so you, you know, obviously one without chemicals. You don't want to stop sweating, you don't want to stop perspiring. And most of those antiperspirants have got horrible chemicals in them anyway. And just think about it, you're putting it right under your armpit, you know, right around all your lymphatic nodes, right near your breasts. Not a good thing. You're absorbing all that. Your skin's a two-way street. It absorbs what you put on it. What can we do to love our skin? We're going to dry skin brush. We're going to exercise. We're going to take saunas if we're lucky enough to have access to a sauna. Well, the last one's kind of extreme, hot and cold showers. You can do that if you feel really, you know, brave. But um, I do that every now and again, but it's uh, extreme. Where's my skin brush? I asked for, oh, here it is. How many of you skin brush? Great, how many of you do it every day? Terrific, because I love my skin brush, but most of the time it's like my treadmill. <laughs> my treadmill is like my closet. I throw my clothes over it. And my skin brush hangs in my bathroom and I don't use it. I might get in a fit of skin brushing and I'll skin brush for two or three days and then I stop. So the thing is, if you're that kind of person too, don't worry. Just go home tonight and pick it up and do it for a few days. Don't think, oh, I can't keep that up or I never do it or whatever. Just pick it up again and do it. If you do it every day, top of the class, that's terrific. But how your skin brush is really important. You never wet it. Don't do it in the shower. Don't, you've got to keep it dry. Why? Anyone think? Friction. We want the friction against your skin. What you're doing when you dry skin brush is, well first of all you're taking off all that dead skin so that feels great, but also you're really stimulating your lymphatic system and you're really stimulating the skin to eliminate more toxins. You want to, the way you do it's important, start at your feet. You can do the bottom of your feet too. Come up your body. This is going to help your lymphatic uh, system as well. You're going to go down your back obviously. Follow that diagram. I thought that was kind of a neat diagram. 
They say to follow with a hot and cold shower. You can do that. I mean, if you're feeling brave enough. It, it is a great feeling. Um, good if you live alone too, because you can scream when you get under the cold shower. You know, that always sounds good. But don't do your face. It's a bit extreme. Don't do any raw skin. Don't do any, you know, real owies, obviously. Dry skin brush, love it. It's a fabulous thing. They say it helps break up cellulite too, so just good to keep doing it. Kidneys, kidneys filter all the blood. All the end products of digestion and cell metabolism. And all the liver detoxification, it all goes through your kidneys. Really important to keep those kidneys working. If you find you get kind of a sore back, maybe you have some kidney issues. I told you to look at your stools, right? Now I want you to look at your urine. See, you're really starting to love yourself. Take a pee, I want you to look at it. What color is it? Really important to look at the color of your urine. If it's really a strong yellow, what might that mean? Sorry, Steve? It could be, a lot of B vitamins. Good point. It can also be you're not drinking enough water. Simple as that. It should not be a strong color. Now some things do color your urine. Beetroot, for example, so if you're really doing your raw foods and you eat a lot of beetroot, you can pee pink or pee red. It's kind of scary. Um, you, you know, but really it should not be a strong color. What else could you maybe do to check your urine? pH. You can definitely do a pH test. That's a and we have some little pH sticks here I was going to show you. That's a good thing to do. But really simple things. You're rushing. You're on your way to work. You take a pee. You look in the toilet. Oh, the colour's all right. But what else? Smell. What if it smells weird? Shouldn't smell weird. Shouldn't smell fishy. Shouldn't smell strong. It shouldn't smell of any chemicals. Those are all triggers to say, hey, something's not right. Now, you can just go and drink more water. If that takes care of it, great. It just means you haven't drunk enough water that day. But if it doesn't go away, that is one of the first signs that you've got an infection. So you really got to pay attention. Now, if you really want to get jazzed about your urine, the other interesting thing you can do is shake it. <laughs> Put it in a jar and shake it. Just see what happens. If it foams, it means you might have too much protein, too many ketones in your, in your urine. And that's not a good thing. That means your, your, your kidneys are not doing their job, they're, they're taxed. So maybe just go have a, a urine test, check it out if you have any of those signs. And of course I gave you some ideas there about what you can do to love your kidneys. Water, whey powder, parsley, dandelion again, see there's a double whammy there, liver and kidneys, green veggies, cleavers, cleavers is a lovely little herb, it grows all over the place, it's that sticky little herb that wants to stick on you, do you know the one I mean? Kind of grows in wild weedy places, we also have it dried here, a nice organic product because you can't get it all the time, make a tea out of it, drink it, you can even put something else in it to make it taste better, put some peppermint or you know mix it with something else it doesn't taste bad but you know it's kind of weedy and uh, great for your kidneys lymphatic system really really important part of elimination um, you can read this I'm not going to go into it but basically you want to think about you know your lymph nodes whenever you feel you know any lymph nodes starting to swell up you've got them here you've got them here you've got them here you know, you really want to realize that uh, your lymph is uh, challenged and we don't want our lymph challenged. We want our lymph just optimally working. How does it aid elimination? You can read this, but it really does uh, a tremendous amount of filtering. It filters the lymph and it, once it's filtered the lymph, it puts it back into the circulation and it puts it back into the circulation through these um, ducts here. And it's really interesting, lymph only travels one way, it's really interesting, but it doesn't have any vessels, no veins, no arteries, it just travels through the, through the, uh, through the uh, matrix of cells. And the only way for it really to move is through uh, physical exercise and massage.
really important. So without full bodied exercise that really makes muscle move and massage, your lymph becomes stagnant. So it's a good reason to get a massage once a week, right? I have to go and have a lymphatic treatment. Is it healthy? How do you know? Do you get a recur recurring sore throat? Do you have any tonsil problems, swollen glands, cysts? Do you have any lumps in your armpits? Obviously, lumps in your armpits, you want to have them checked out immediately, but those are all things. How to love your lymphatic system? Dry skin brushing, we already talked about. Massage, saunas, regular bo full bodied exercise. Oh, and it looks like my, my writing dropped down over there, but that's massage as well. And the thing you can do yourself, self-massage is really a very useful thing to do. When you're sitting watching TV, massage your lymph reflex point on your feet, which is the groove between your big toe and your, and your first toe. If you go in there, you'll feel a groove, right, down that tendon. Massage that. Just, you know, not for very long, but, you know, maybe five minutes each side. And um, do it regularly, just whenever you think about it waiting for the bus, sitting in the doctor's office. Obviously you don't want to have smelly feet because you're going to be, you know, you know what I mean. Some more things there too. Um, hang on, I just skipped over one slide very briefly. So there's quite a lot else you can do for your lymph. Um, potassium, potassium and chlorine. Uh, I don't know if any of you use cell salts, but Kaylee Foss is really good. And there's that cleavers again. Uh, Echinacea is a great herb, yellow dock, burdock, red clover, and oat straw. Oat straw is a wonderful herb. Um, what I really like to do with oat straw is I make a decoction. And by that I mean I just put some in a stainless steel pot with some uh, non-chlorinated, non-fluoridated water, simmer it for about 20 minutes, covered. I strain out the oat straw and then I use that as a basis for example, you know, maybe put some organic apple juice in it or maybe I'll put, maybe I'll use that to, um, you know, infuse maybe a passion tea bag or something like that. So I use it as a basis. On its own it tastes a bit straw-like but it's a wonderful, wonderful drink. Not only is it really good for your lymph, it's really high in silicon. And silicon they call the magnetic mineral. And when you have a lot of silicon in your body, your nails are strong, your hair is shiny, you have a lot of zing, you have a lot of magnetism. So, I mean, we all need more oat store, right? I think it's a great mineral. Your nails are obviously a really important way of checking out your, your health because, you know, these are all simple things we can look at. I went over, I know for some of you this is your lunch break. Um, Great if you are not a student with us to uh, check us out. Um, obviously, uh, you know, we teach a lot of what we've just learned about today. We are an accredi accredited college. Uh, you can um, study with us online. We do both uh, associate uh, and uh, master's degrees and also certificates and diplomas. And we've been around since 1978, so we kind of know what we're doing, which is a great feeling. We also have the college store here. You'll see everything in this store I personally have used, I've read, I don't uh, choose any one line. Uh, there may be things that um, I like in a line, maybe some things I don't. All the herbs and oils I've personally selected, I've gone to where they're growing, check them out, check the organic certification. We are an Oregon Tool certified facility. So um, I'm very, very uh, stringent with the whole organic thing. I only believe, I believe your results are only as good as the, as the product to begin with. Um, we have a teaching garden, so you're welcome to walk around if you've got some time. Um, I can open up the side garden. We've got a lovely lot of shade plants there. We've got um, a black cohosh, which is fun to look at for those of you who are into herbal medicine. They're kind of rare and difficult to come across if you really want to see it. Uh, so, of course, the store is open to the public. Um, come and visit us on Twitter. For those of you who Twitter, that's a great way to find out what we're doing. Um, we love it when you go to Facebook, if you're a Facebooker and like us. 
Uh, so we have a page for the college, we have a page for the store, and we have a page for the uh, ACHS Urban Herb Botanical Garden. You can subscribe to our YouTube. And we have actually made a video today, so you, uh, when you subscribe, you'll get notification that this video is uh, up there. If you have any questions or comments at all, please email me. And you can call me as well, of course, but i um, happy to answer anything, uh, anything regarding the lecture or any questions that might come up for you when you go away and think about it. If you're trying to incorporate any of what we've talked about today into your own life and you have any you know, issues with that, um, I, I don't mind at all giving you, um, you know, some advice there. Um, or helping you out with letting you know, you know, of some good naturopaths or other people to visit in the location. What I did today is I just put out some products and, and really good books about detoxification. Um, this clean book I really like. Um, it's got some great recipes in it, some really good ideas for, um, you know, eating clean. It's a great book. If you're interested in acid alkaline, this book, the acid alkaline book is, is really good. Yeah, this one here, really, really good. This is the clean book. If you're just starting on a health program, um, this is a great thing to do. It's really fun. It's fun to do this with a friend, eight weeks to uh, optimal health, because it really lays out what you can do in a, in a great way. Here are the pH sticks we talked about. That's what you were, were talking about. And you know, just some um, Ayurvedic detox help. These are, are good for constipation, but only every now and again. It's not something I recommend on a long-term basis or even on a, you know, a daily basis over a long period of time. Uh, really, uh, uh, <coughs> bowel support is going to come through fiber, not through taking something like Senna. And, I, and the interesting thing is the psyllium, which most is you know mostly what people recommend for constipation is one of the soluble fibers and for a lot of people that just doesn't work and of course that's why because it's it's dissolving this little uh, DVD is going to help you understand this whole pH thing and here we have some great herbal teas that actually one of our graduates um, blended and made this is a kidney bladder detox tea and this is a um, love your liver detox tea this is really good Detox Diet is a good book. Uh, again, this is, uh, like I said, these are all books I've enjoyed reading and I think they've all got some helpful advice. And uh, Dr. Jensen, bless his heart, he is the um, very famous doctor, uh, American doctor, who really, he was a neurologist and he really developed a huge awareness um, regarding bowel health and he's written some phenomenal books with some pretty scary photographs if you want to freak yourself out about, um, <laughs> about bowels. Um, this is a fibre I use. Um, this is a vegan fibre, we don't sell this here, but if you're interested I can uh, help you find out where to get it. Uh, I love this fibre, it's all from um, uh, apple pectin, uh, beet fibre, citrus pectin and inulin which is a wonderful substance from uh, Jerusalem artichokes that really helps your pancreas. A great, great fiber. After just using one scoop of this in my smoothie every morning, within two days, you can see a remarkable difference in, the, um, in your elimination. It's really very regulating. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for your attention. You are just a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you find it helpful and, and can, uh, you know, use some of the information we learnt today. And, and uh, Tracy will be, if you've all filled out one of those little slips, did everyone register? Okay, great. She will send you this um, presentation so you'll have it for reference. Thank you very much.